Let's begin. Hey there, scary story fanatics. Welcome back to Cleaving Thought from Bone with your host, Sociopathic. Ever notice that getting through the holidays can be a lot of work? For some of us, it's a real chore. And for others, you have no idea. So sit back, relax, and get ready for the story I've been dying years to talk about. The book exclusive that I like to call Santa's Sweatshop. When I was really little, I believed in Santa Claus. As I grew a bit older, I stopped believing, as most children do. However, I believe now. I've never stopped believing since that fateful Christmas all those years ago. It was my tenth Christmas. I remember this specifically because my dad was making such a big deal over me turning eleven the following month. I was sure that mom and dad knew what I wanted for Christmas, as I'd been talking about it incessantly for the few months leading up to the holiday. However, it was my disdain at being asked to write a letter to Santa that I think instigated the cascade of terror to follow. I'm going to be 11 soon, and only babies believe in Santa, I'd explained to my parents. Mom spoke up from behind my father and explained that not only was Santa real, but only those who believed in him received a Santa present as well. I also knew this was yet another falsity, concocted by my parents. I had already found what they were surely giving to me as Santa gifts, still unwrapped inside shopping bags, labeled with their department store logos, all stuffed neatly beneath their bed. Of course, locating these items and effectively ruining one's Christmas is no difficult task for a child left to his own devices, home alone, while his parents run errands by themselves. My parents could claim reasons as to why I should believe, but all of those reasons were nonsense. I never told them that I knew the truth, or how I knew. I kept that information to myself, using it to solidify my fallacious beliefs even as I tucked myself into bed on a chilly evening, the eve of Christmas Day. I opened my eyes at the sound of what I believed to be a thud on the roof, making my assertions concrete when my now pricked ears detected the disturbance once again. Even at that age, I wholly believed it to be the effect of snowfall accumulation that had just been shaken loose from a highly elevated tree limb, left to dangle silently in the wind of a crisp December night. The house was nestled deep within a heavily forested tree line, and subsequently had numerous pines that rose above its highest peak. Therefore, this assumption of fallen snow causing the noises on the roof was not entirely impossible. What did force my mind into second-guessing my assumptions was the now clattering sound coming from somewhere downstairs, near to or in the living room. I knew for a fact that both my parents were asleep. Mom took medication for sleep and Dad liked his whiskey. It would take a locomotive steaming through their bedroom to awake them at this time of night. With an unenthusiastic yet ponderous mind, I slowly crept from bed and made my way for the hall. From there, I crept downstairs and turned the corner towards the living room, standing in the entranceway, scanning everything comprising its contents that lent itself to my eyes. I saw nothing that instantly stood out. And the room itself was dimly illuminated by a nearby tree, glittering with what seemed like 
a million twinkle lights. Stockings were hung above the fireplace, now all bulging with contents that were awaiting to be discovered inside. Presents of familiar shapes and sizes rested decoratively beneath the tree, and the plate of cookies had now been emptied, a glass of milk less than half full. Now, maybe to another child of similar age, all these notable factors may have contributed to unabated enthusiasm. But to my skeptical self, I knew that all I saw before me to be staged by my parents. My true purpose of locating the source of the noise that I detected earlier still eluded me. With a shrug, I turned to head back to bed, and that's when I saw him standing there. Hello there, Barry, he said in a raspy but high-pitched, almost helium-assisted tone. This thing, or person, looked like a man, but was my size, the size of a child. His nose was long, which was actually complemented by the pointy shoes that he was wearing. The clothes he wore were a mix of winter greens trimmed in brilliant red, accompanied perfectly by the long, slender, and pointy hat that he wore atop his head of the same color scheme. The short man's beard was brown, flecked with gray and white, and looked much in the way cinder ashes do when mixed together with snow plowed into a bank. His grin seemed more friendly than sinister, so even though I found myself in silent shock, I made no attempts trying to flee. It was now the sense of intrigue that grasped my attention. I heard you don't believe in Santa Claus, the man said flatly. I nodded in agreement and managed a disjointed, uh-huh, but was still unable to formulate any real thoughts. I figured that I had to be dreaming. Take my hand. I want to show you something, he insisted, holding out a hand for me. Here, I hesitated for a moment, for this was some unknown thing standing in my house offering to take me somewhere. Had it been any other night, under any other context, and my better judgment would have surely taken the mental reins. But it was Christmas Eve after all, and though it was outside the realm of normal happenstance, I could not help but take him up on his offer. I grabbed a hold of his hand, and it was as if we were instantly ushered away on wings of magic. I saw my house grow smaller in the dead of night until it blended in with the rest of the white and dark gray hues, and now mixed in indistinguishably with the world below. I saw cities and oceans fly by in an instant, villages and forests, mountain ranges, until nothing but a blanket of thick snow outstretched for what seemed like forever before us. Moments later, our velocity slowed, Shortly thereafter, we were both set down gently in the middle of this icy, barren wasteland. Looking around, the bite of a terrible cold now gnawing at the skin beneath my flimsy bedwear, I saw nothing in the name of habitation. No houses or street signs, no distant lights indicating native life. There was nothing but blistered drifts of ice and snow. Where are we? I turned and asked my elfish companion. With a smile and a wink, the thing touched his pointer digit to his nose just before a strange, loud humming emanated from beneath my feet. The ice and earth cracked and gave way all around me before the world around us began growing taller. A fraction of a second later, and I realized that we were lowering into the snow and earth while the world around us sat resolute and uncaring of unfolding events. As everything around me grew dark, I lost sight of the small man nearby. There were only lights of swirling colors in the northern sky above us. 
I lowered my head and tried scanning my surroundings once again, but to no avail. Then, there was a loud boom, followed by total blackness. Something had sealed the sky above from my view. And then, just as suddenly, I was encircled by a thin line of light that grew thicker as we lowered further into the ground. As we came to rest at the bottom of this elevator-like shaft, I realized myself to be standing amidst the most wonderful and fantastical sights that I'd ever dreamed of. There were strange, almost comical machines that made weird noises as they twirled and spun. There were carts full of nearly any kind of sweet treat ever heard of. There were so many cakes, pies, chocolate, it was endless. Reindeer sauntered by us, being led by similar beings to the one that had brought me here, all seemingly happy, but almost apathetic to my presence. And speaking of which, there were presents, wrapped in papers of every color, everywhere. They towered like walls, formed corridors, tables, and sat on shelves. I'd never seen so many presents in my life. What are we... I began, but I was interrupted by being pulled in some seemingly impromptu direction. The various elf-like beings smiled and waved as they walked by, some looking a little too happy, almost eager, but I smiled and waved in kind just the same. There was no reason not to at this point. It was as if... I was wrapped in a safety blanket of child-friendly magic, impervious to danger. Moments later, I would start to find out exactly how wrong I was. My first inclination that something was wrong hit me as we neared the destination still unknown to me. I was just starting to wonder how and where all these gifts were made when we passed by the doorway to a room that caught my attention. Inside, I saw several, if not a hundred elves, all sitting at long tables with long, schematic drawings on rolls, small and large plastic and metal bits, and various tools and equipment for putting those bits together. We were walking pretty briskly, but it looked as though each and every one of those small beings was quite distraught, on the verge of tears, or even visibly saddened. Each was dressed in drab, gray rags. This stark contrast to the light-hearted and jovial atmosphere mixed with my mental palate like vinegar on cake. Something about this whole situation was starting to seem a bit off, more unorthodox than being swept off to some unknown land by some seemingly magical creature. What's wrong with them? I asked my escort as we passed by the space. What's wrong with her? He asked in return, expressing that he had no idea what it was that I was talking about. Those... Those elves, they look sad, I explained myself. Oh, they're not there. No, they're not elves, and there's actually a very good explanation, the creature explained so lightheartedly his tone seemed to put me at ease. Oh, really? What are those? Aren't you an elf? I finally asked him, wanting to know what about this place could be so sad and spawn so much misery. Well, Beryl, it's actually easier to show you than it is to explain. And believe me or not, the reindeer can help elaborate. He delivered. Really? Yes, and their pens are right through the store, he said, as he slowed his pace to a stop and pointed to the right at a nearby door. I walked over to it, and the small creature unlocked the knob with one of the many keys on his magnanimous keychain. I remember thinking how funny it was that a magical being would have a need for such crude devices such as locks and keys. With a turn and a push, the colorful door creaked open, 
and the space beyond was so dark that I could gain no further detail. My escort stood near the open door and motioned for me to get closer. Apprehension long since cast aside, I took two more steps and peered hard into the darkness. I felt a strong shove on my back at the same instance that I detected an unpleasant potpourri of odors. I was shoved so hard that I in fact fell over, stumbling through the doorway. Now, the faint, muffled sounds of wailing and tones of pleading reached my ears, and as I turned to identify what had pushed me, I only saw the small man that had brought me here, standing in the doorway, a sinister grin now locked onto his face, a menacing glare in his eyes directed at me. I began to climb to my feet as he started speaking to me with explanation. I told you it would be simpler to show you, and soon your whole fate would be realized, Barry. For the ones you referred to in the toy-making shop are not elves like me. Those are your new co-workers, he finished. I honestly expected him to continue, as I now had even more questions with too few answers. But I soon felt a strong tug at both shoulders from behind. A thunderbolt of fear charged through me as I finally realized how dire my situation truly was and the terrible implications of the answers that I sought. I watched as that sinister grin grew more distant as I was unwillingly dragged deeper into the darkness, still unable to catch a glimpse of my abductors. As we turned a sharp corner to the right, that evil glare disappeared from my sight entirely as the sounds of woe and misery crescendoed around me, revealing their source. My inner thoughts and trepidations now mirroring the chorus of misery that grew closer in the dark. The next thing I can recall happening is being tossed inside a dark room-like space through a set of chain-link gates. Gates, I would soon discover, were quite a bit more unwavering than one may initially perceive. There was a musty, lived-in aroma that was invasive and prevailing as it was pungent. There were sounds of whimpering and crying and faint pleads for help nearby in the black. But all of these elements were set aside as I turned and lunged at the gates in one fluid motion. Before I could reach them, they slammed shut with a bang. The lock engaged before I could muscle my way past the two captors on the other side. Beings I found to be nothing but elves like the one that had brought me here in the first place. I instantly found myself befuddled at their strength. Even at my age, I stood more than a foot taller than each of them, and yet both were capable of manhandling me with no more difficulty than that which a professional bodybuilder may exhibit. Then, despite my rattling of the gate and woeful inquiries, the pair simply walked off as if not hearing me at all through the barrier. A barrier that was more porous than not. As my mind reeled at my surroundings, confronted with a horror that I had not imagined in my wildest nightmares, slowly the sounds of whimpers and whispers again came into audible and mental clarity. My attention reshifted. For a moment, I saw nothing but black shadows all around me, and although the sounds seemed as though they emanated from sources nearby, I wondered how far those shadows stretched back into unknown fathoms of pitch. Soon, though, my eyes began to adjust, and details in the darkness started becoming exponentially more defined. The floor itself was nothing more than dirt wet in most places to make a sticky, mucky substrate. Metal rattled alongside the sorrowful cries in the dark, and I soon knew that to be the sound of chains. Along the back side of this room, the walls starting to become more clearly defined all around me, was what looked like a large feeding trough for farm animals. It was then that my vision had adjusted enough to the darkness that amorphous moving shapes began lending themselves to my awareness. Nothing but 
child-sized humanoid shapes at first, but I would soon discover this to be the truth, that these were children who were in fact chained to the surrounding walls. They also were the source of the nearby whimpering and whispers detected earlier. I was still in quite a bit of shock and found myself hesitant to approach any of them initially when a soft voice spoke up in the darkness to my left. You didn't believe, did you? Of course I was silent for a moment, contemplating the absurdity of my circumstances until I replied with a nod of agreement. They take kids and make us work, and they make us build the toys, and they treat us like livestock. Most newcomers resist, refuse, don't do that. They hurt you, or worse. The child finished explaining, face still hidden by darkness. But why? I don't understand. I responded back, and as I did, the young boy who was speaking to me leaned forward a bit, allowing the dim light from the holes beyond the gate to grace his features and provide semblance of some kind of visual identity. The boy seemed to be my age, his hair disheveled and seemingly not touched or seen by a brush with the intention to groom in quite some time, as in months most likely. His clothes, at first inspection, seemed to be nothing more than a collection of dirty brown rags that had been used in a way to mimic clothing. However, the more I stared, the more I noticed patterns and writing etched into the fabrics and this is when I realized that he was wearing actual clothing, but his attire looked as though he'd been wearing them for an age, never being changed out of them for the purposes of washing them. In fact, the half dozen or so children that accompanied him in that room were all dressed in similar wardrobes. All those kids were being treated like animals, held captive against their will, and I was sure that I was to be no different. Seeing them was like looking into the future and seeing my intended fate. This was far worse than I could ever have imagined. I was to be used as slave labor for Santa Claus and kept against my will, chained up in the reindeer pen just like an animal, all because I didn't believe. Well, I surely believed then, even repeated the phrase over and over, hoping it may buy me passage out of here. But even then, I knew it was too late to believe in Santa. I then burst into tears, wanting to go home, begging to no one of any authority to listen that I wanted my mother. The young boy that I had been talking to reshuffled himself a little bit so as to get closer to and comfort me. But before he could get close enough to place a hand on my shoulder, the gates began to rattle and the boy backed up against the wall once again. Before I could even turn my head fully to investigate the noise, three small guards, garbed in elf attire, marched in single file through the now open gateway. Two moved towards me while the third headed in towards the boy, unshackling his chains. The rest of the children whimpered and huddled in their respective shadows along the walls. No, I won't, I began, but before I could finish, I felt every muscle in my body tense up as I fell face first into the mucky, soft floor of earth and mud. Don't fight them, I heard the boy say as his voice became more and more distant. He'd been dragged away to some unknown location. As I was grabbed to my feet, I got a good look at what I'd been hit with, and once I realized the stick in my captor's hand to be a cattle prod, my reaction at being hit with it made all the more sense. Once again, I was dragged through the hallways of bright colors, holiday themes, and wrapped gifts. I hollered and fought against the shoves and pushes, guiding me into a forward direction, but each time I resisted, I'd get a shock from the cattle prod in response. At this point, I was full out sobbing with despair and hopelessness, but when we rounded the corner, the large workshop, children toiling without end, stacking presents large and small in loading bins nearby. I got an idea. 
My captors led me to a seat between two other children, both a little younger than me, and both just as disheveled and unkempt as the boy chained up in the pens, whom I also now saw at the far end of the shop, beyond the veritable sea of knickknacks, wrapping paper, and several work tables. The only thing I did have going for my plan was that there were far more children than elves, outnumbering them ten to one at least. I pondered the thought that maybe if we stuck together, that maybe we could overcome this holiday fanatical faction. As I thought, however, I paid strict attention to the work orders placed in front of me in the forms of various leafs of paper describing orders and details for shipment. Two or three of these, and I found the next order was for a large package, specialty blankets and clothing. Hmm, I guess Santa does give kids clothes, I thought to myself. Once nearly done with the packaging, I slowed my progress, awaiting the right time to bring it over to what can only be described as a gift wrapping machine. It was an odd looking device similar in shape to a log splitter with a large box at one end in which unwrapped gifts entered and the finished product emerges from the other. And then I heard it. Ho ho ho! A deep bellowing laugh that rattled so low it rumbled the inside of my chest. Assuming that I knew the source, I turned to face in its direction and found that I was indeed correct. A large man, dressed all in red, stood upon a small platform at the back side of the room. He was clad in red with white fluffy trim from his hat to the bottom of his festive pants. His boots were jet black and the majority of his wrinkled face was obstructed by wispy white facial hair. Santa had seemingly appeared to gather everyone's attention. And this was my chance. I would have included some of the other children held captive, letting them in on my plan, but I knew that if I were going to have the best chance of escaping, I'd need to proceed alone. Besides, it's like those kids were brainwashed or something, beaten and demeaned into submission until they fully believed that there was no chance of absconding. All of the other guards, the child prisoners, everyone was turned and focused on the man in red. So, making it seem like I was just doing as I was told, I moved the large package over to the wrapping machine, made sure no one was looking, and climbed inside the box. My plan worked. It's hard to say how long I lay still inside of that package trying desperately not to make a sound. It certainly felt like days or even weeks, but not once did I feel hungry or a need for a bathroom. Still, once the package had stumbled into place and I could hear the sound of boots on wood getting fainter until completely gone, I opened the box from inside and peered out. I was astonished that it was still Christmas Eve. I still have no way of accurately explaining the differential in time perception, but once calling for help at the resident's home and being picked up by my parents, bombarding me with a plethora of questions that I could not answer, those unexplained happenstances were fleeting in my mind. Instead, my attention remained firm on what I'd overheard the large man in the red suit say in his speech as I harvested my plan to fruition. The last thing that I heard before I escaped from everyone's sight, that next year's projections are nearly triple that of this one's, and that even more children, more help, was believed to be needed in order to satisfy the quota. So, be mindful, boys and girls. You may not believe in Santa Claus, he certainly believes in you. Well, just remember, no matter what you got for Christmas, somebody worked very hard for it, including 
probably some slave labor. And if you're looking to not laboriously look for some more good horror and gore galore, make sure to stop by here again next weekend. And until then, make sure to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications so I can catch you all again next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs>